All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this morning's webinar. This morning, we are joined by President of Certain Access, Jeff Felice. Um, and our webinar today will be Artificial Intelligence Essentials, No More Than Your Smart Home Assistant. So we'll let some more people start rolling in as Jeff gets started and go ahead and take it away, Jeff. Thank you so much, Shane, and, and thank you everyone for taking your time today to uh, spend the next uh, 45 minutes to hour with us. Uh, we recognize that your uh, time is your most valuable asset, so we appreciate you spending it with us. Uh, as Shannon shared, uh, the, the session today is going to be about artificial intelligence and learning the essentials, so some of the foundational uh, terminology and concepts, and uh, looking at how we can potentially apply those in our workplace today. Uh, my name is uh, Jeff Felice, as uh, Shannon stated, and I serve as the president of CertNexus. If you're not familiar with CertNexus, we're a global certification body focused on vendor-neutral emerging technologies. So we provide high-stakes certifications for technology professionals and micro-credentials uh, for business professionals as well. So I'm going to uh, turn off my video uh, just because we're going to be uh, looking at a lot of content on screen. So I'm going to turn it off while we're presenting the content and then turn it back on uh, during the Q&A session here. So I'm just going to do that quickly here. And um, well, let's talk about artificial intelligence. Um, the first thing is to know is that it's here. In fact, all of us have probably interacted with artificial intelligence today. So if you've done a search on Google or Bing or any large search engine, you've used artificial intelligence. If uh, you use a streaming service, whether that was Spotify or Netflix or any other streaming service, you're using artificial intelligence. If you purchase something on a large uh, e-commerce uh, uh, e platform like Amazon or a similar platform, you likely used artificial intelligence. In fact, if you use the autocomplete when you're texting or in your uh, Gmail or Outlook e email, you were utilizing artificial intelligence. So the fact is, is that art although artificial intelligence is known as an emerging technology, which still hasn't realized its full potential, we're using it in our everyday life today. And for many of you, you probably have seen it more and more in the news of late because of a concept called generative AI. If you're not familiar with generative AI, this is where we're starting to be able to create, generate uh, images, video, audio, text, and even programming code using artificial intelligence. In fact, I wanna show you how this works today um, because again, you may have seen it in the news um, reference to chat GPT or other uh, large uh, generative AI models like Dolly or other ones as well. Um, but we're going to go and, and look at an example right now. And what I'd like to do is and someone in chat can just provide me any topic that you would like to learn something about today. So any any topic at all, if you can just put it in the chat and we're going to do a quick blog here. And someone can just type anything in chat. It can be anything that you want to learn something about. We're going to pick while you're doing that. I'm going to say it's a friendly note and we're, and we're going to actually uh, do this for a customer. Any ideas? I don't see anything coming through chat. So let's just talk about um, how uh, coffee is grown and roasted. So I don't know anything about coffee. I, in fact, I don't even really drink coffee. I just selected it because some of you may be having your morning coffee. And so what I've done is, is you write is actually a generative AI. And what I've done here is I'm said, hey, I wanna write a blog. I'm gonna choose a friendly tone. I'm gonna write it for an audience that are customers. And I'm gonna use these prompts, these operators to talk about what the message is gonna be about. And I could do a, a, a lot more here. You can see it allows for a thousand characters and I've done 31. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna say write new. And this is what generative AI does. It takes these prompts, which is how does coffee grown and roasted? And it's actually going to write a short blog in a friendly tone intended for a customer. So again, this is all AI behind the scenes that's gonna be generating this text. So what we're seeing again with this generative AI is not the ability only to write text, but we're also able to generate images. Uh, so here's the, here's the uh, blog, the short blog that was written by generative AI. So you can see, I haven't been typing anything. I'm sharing my screen here. And it says, welcome to the wonderful world of coffee. 
Um, it talks about how every cup has a unique flavor and aroma. And then it talks about how it starts off on beans and bushes, right? In tropical regions around the world, how they're sorted according to size and color. And then how during roasting, they're heated up until it turns to an oily surface, et cetera. These are things I don't know about coffee, right? But what I was able to do using these prompts, I was able to generate uh, text through using one of these generative AI models, in this case on you.com uh, you and their, their tool, you write. So if you've heard a lot about this in the news lately, this is what generative AI is. It's the ability to take text and actually from text, create other text, create images, or even create, uh, in some cases, uh, audio as well. So I'm gonna uh, show you here quickly. Oops, I apologize, I went too far. Um, I'm going to control tab here. And uh, for those who are Nirvana fans, I'm not a huge Nirvana fan, but AI software uh, written by Google has actually created a brand new a song by Nirvana. So the, the Google AI wrote um, the lyrics and it also wrote the music. And now, and I won't play this for you because some may or may not like Nirvana, but there's actually a new song that is essentially a Nirvana song that is, and what it did was it actually went through the catalog in Nirvana songs, looked at the, the type of music, the musical notes that are being played, as well as the, the lyrics um, that were uh, written and sung by Kurt Cobain, and actually has created a brand new um, song. And I'll, I'll play a, a minute of it for you so you can just hear. So this sounds like Nirvana for those who are Nirvana fans. And that kind of sounds like Kurt Cobain. That is all artificial intelligence. Another example of artificial intelligence is we're now using it in robotics as well. And so there's a robot now, this is from um, a, a group called Boston Dynamics, and they've actually created a robot that actually can now, uh, actually has the ability to understand its surroundings using computer vision. It has the ability to uh, navigate and you can see now it actually has hands and has actually the ability to pick up something from, in this case, the ground or whatever it is. And you can see, and again, I won't go through all this, the whole video, but it has the ability to do human-like actions, right? And so this robot is, again, a, a physical representation of artificial intelligence and the, some of the capabilities that it has, as you can see here, doing all these things, um, so, you know, such as walking, moving, et cetera. So again, uh, this is yet a different example of artificial intelligence, but wanted to just share with you what you may, some of the things that you may be seeing in, uh, in the news today and what's behind it. So, but going back to generative AI, right? This is essentially, it's our ability to create other types of media using text, right? As simply as that. So what will we uh, cover today? We're gonna to start with a brief history of, of artificial intelligence. Um, some may not know, um, modern artificial intelligence is 70 years old, um, although we've been using it really well over the past five to 10 years. We're gonna define the types of artificial intelligence. Then we're gonna dig a, a level deeper and talk about the various approaches to AI. And then we'll discuss how AI is transforming the industry. And then we'll have a and A at the end. So let's start with the uh, artificial intelligence in a brief history of it. Um, so those, some of you may be familiar with Alan Turing. Um, he actually created what's called the Turing test. And the Turing test really tests for artificial intelligence. Is, as we'll learn, is a uh, machine able to comp complete a human action? Is essentially what the test is. It's a yes or no. It's a binary uh, test that, he, that was created at that time. So really the concept of AI really started to formulate then. The term was actually coined at Dartmouth uh, University in 1956. And then we had a, our very few uh, first instances of artificial intelligence with Udemate, which actually was a robotic arm on a, a manufacturing, I think it was a GM uh, manufacturing uh, floor. And then we had a couple other examples of it. And then oddly for technology, because technology continues, typically continues just to progress, with AI, in 1973, a paper was published and said, hey, we're never really going to achieve this thing called artificial intelligence. And so we experienced our first AI winter where there was very little investment in artificial intelligence 
whether from uh, nations, uh, academic, or uh, commercial or uh, investment either. Then we had expert systems, and these systems were able to do one thing really well, but they were soon supplanted by the personal computer. We experienced our, our next AI winner. And then in 1997, IBM released Deep Blue, and Deep Blue was developed to play chess. And uh, famously, it, it actually beat the grandmaster champion, Gary Kasparov, at a game of chess. And that really started to get people thinking about what are the capabilities if AI can beat a grand chess ma uh, master, what else can it do? And we started to see the continued investment in AI, in which, which of late has accelerated. We've seen things like uh, the Grand Challenge, uh, which was autonomous vehicles able to circumnavigate a, a road course. And then we had see, saw some uh, assisting or uh, technologies like having cloud uh, technologies, uh, having big data repositories, having graphical processing units, GPUs, that allowed for more processing um, of more uh, data. And all of that, those facilitating technologies started to help really the, uh, facilitate the investment in artificial intelligence. And this is where you saw IBM has uh, re released uh, the next version of uh, their AI, I IBM Watson. Uh, Google released Google Brain, then Google then through uh, their parent company, Alphabet, um, released DeepMind. And now we're in the 2020s where we're seeing these generative AI models like GPT-3, Dolly, and ChatGPT. So again, we've seen this rapid acceleration really in the past 10 years of AI, although it is a technology that has been around for uh, almost seven, eight decades now. And really that acceleration, as I shared, has happened over the last handful of years. And it really is a global expansion of artificial intelligence. So what we're seeing is we're seeing uh, private industry invest heavily in AI. We're seeing academic research being in, invested in at levels that we previously had never seen, and that's only accelerating. But we're also seeing nation states as well. Again, what we're seeing is this, um, it's almost an arms race, if you would like, again, um, but this around artificial intelligence, the, the belief that whoever has the greatest artificial intelligence will have the greatest supremacy in, um, in you know, world politics and et cetera. So there's been significant investment um, in AI from that perspective as well. So before we go on, I just want to ask uh, you a question, and you can just type this in the chat. Just type one, two, or three, or four. But how do you engage with AI today? Um, answer one is: uh, Do you use technology that uh, use AI technology at work? Um, are you responsible for developing AI solutions? Would be two. Uh, your job does not require you to interact with AI. That's three. Or you use technology, uh, AI technology at home, and that would be four. So if you'd like, you can just type those in the chat window. And again, just chat one, two, or three, or four. Great, we may have the chat disabled. I don't see folks chatting. Ah, here we go. Great, we're starting to see them come in. Great. And we're seeing a lot of fours, right? Um, for the most part. Uh, and it is true, most of us are using more AI technology at home than we are at work. But I bet you're using it at work because most of you are probably again using Gmail or Microsoft Outlook. And you know that autocomplete when you're typing a word and it autocompletes the word or auto will autocomplete a phrase or a sentence? That's artificial intelligence. That's what's called natural language processing or NLP. So that is a type of artificial intelligence. So some of us, again, may knowingly or unknowingly, may be using AI at work today. It just hasn't been presented to us as artificial intelligence. In fact, the same thing, right? If we're doing searches at work on Google or Bing or whatever our search platform is, again, those platforms all use artificial intelligence, right? You think about it, and it because when I'm doing a search, let's just say I'm uh, at the uh, Super Bowl, the, uh, the NFL Super Bowl is coming up. If I was to do a search today on uh, the Kansas City Chiefs, what I would probably get is maybe the score of their last game or some build up to the Super Bowl. But what if I'm at the the day of the Super Bowl at the time of the game, let's say it's kickoff at 630 and I search at seven, what's going to come back is probably the score of that game act, that's actively being played. All that contextualized information that's coming back to me, those results 
are all part um, served up by artificial intelligence. Great, thanks everyone for participating in, in that discussion. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is the types of artificial intelligence. And first let's define what artificial intelligence is. Simply, artificial intelligence is the ability of machines to exhibit human-like intelligence. So it's the ability for machines to essentially make decisions. We'll talk about how they go about doing that, but it makes a decision and it acts on that decision. It essentially can provide some predictive uh, information to us. It can do, as you saw with the robot, it can help the robot actually maneuver in the physical space. You, can saw, you saw with the generative AI, it actually allowed me to type in some prompts and actually generate a blog. Um, it also can create music. Um, so it can do a number of things that we as humans can do. And that's how we measure it. Is it essentially can it complete a task that we as humans could complete? And when we think about um, AI, there's, there's two um, types of AI that we discuss today. The fact is, is, is robust as the capability is that I just showed you by writing a blog with a few prompts, we still call that narrow AI or narrow art, artificial intelligence. So again, what narrow artificial intelligence is, is really where AI can approximate some of our traits, but it has no capacity for reasoning, right? It essentially, when I what, it, what that AI did, that generative AI did was, it learned from a lot of content on the web and it actually, but it doesn't understand that content. All it understands is I wanted to write a blog about coffee. It has a lot of information about coffee and it distilled that down into a blog, but it doesn't have any ra rationale for doing that other than it's been trained to do that. And narrow AI solves a few designated problems and is really, again, our current reality where we are today. General AI, and I just read an article this uh, this morning that someone's predicted that we'll have general artificial intelligence or general AI within the next seven years, at least um, specific to language and the ability to translate language. So this is where we, uh, AI has the same or better cognition than humans, right? It has the ability that we as humans can do from a cognitive perspective, at least for a set a small set of tasks or a growing set of tasks. Um, so it extrapolate, extrapolates reasoning, right? So again. It doesn't have the same reasoning capabilities we do as humans, but it has the ability to extrapolate information to make reasoned or rational decisions as we would do. It can solve a number of problems. So there is an AI now that is um, can do um, hundreds of tasks and it's teaching itself to do more tasks. But again, most AI can't do multiple things. It can't do what I'm doing right now, which is speech, moving my hand, being able to um, actually, you know, click a mouse, et cetera, all those things. And general AI currently is not a reality today. And then there's something that's called super intelligence or super AI um, that would be where uh, machines have much greater capabilities than we do. That's really kind of a, the realm of sci-fi right now. Um, but, and hopefully that never happens um, because, you know, then the, the world would be ruled by machines. But again, Talking about artificial intelligence, again, the ability for machines to complete human tasks are these two common types of narrow and general AI. So how does machine learning work? Well, machines um, don't, again, they, they don't have intelligence, but what we do is we help them understand the information that's being provided to them. And where machine learning and deep learning differ from uh, traditional programming is, traditional programming is a, and I'm oversimplifying, but a series of nested if then statements, right? If I click a cell in Microsoft Excel, it bolts. If I type one, two, three, then one, two, three displays, right? So programmatically, Excel is bound to do certain things and it's all, it's all rule-based and it will do those things. Now we can extend it through scripting and things like that, but it's, it's really, it doesn't, it doesn't learn, right? Whereas machine learning does, what we do is we take a data, a data, what we call a training set of data, and we push it through an algorithm. That algorithm makes predictions. It'll evaluate those predictions, and then it learns from those predictions, and it improves the algorithm over time. So as, as I feed my algorithm more data, it will actually make, uh, it, well, we, I, I loosely use the word term better, but it makes better predictions. 
So it, and over time, it gets better and better and being able to identify what those likely outcomes are going to be. Deep learning is a type of machine learning, but essentially it makes its decisions through multiple layers. And we'll learn more about this, but typically you would see, um, for example, if you see on your phone, uh, many of our phones can identify um, people that we take a lot of photos of, right? So my uh, my phone knows, you know, um, I'll get a, a feed of here are images of um, my spouse or I'll get images of uh, a sunset, right? Well, how does it know that? Well, it takes an image and it breaks that image down into it, its base, uh, uh, in this case, shapes. It, typically, it does it at the pixel level, but it can see, you know, it's a crescent moon, a triangle, a rhombus, an ellipsis. Then it says, hey, these are components of a face. And then it makes it at, at the higher level, it says, okay, these are faces of, you know, potentially it could be a person, a rabbit, et cetera. And it correctly predicts that it's a, it's a human face. And so that's how deep learning works. So it's, it's essentially, it's a more complex way of um, essentially uh, using artificial intelligence, and we'll learn a little bit more about this as well. So then these are how the relate, uh, these concepts relate. So think about artificial intelligence. It's really an umbrella technology concept, right? It's the ability for human, or excuse me, machines to complete human tasks. Machine learning is the most often used type of artificial intelligence, and deep learning is a subset of machine learning. And again, we use that for our most complex problems like natural language processing that I talked about. When we saw that robot moving, it's using computer vision. That's using deep learning. Now we are seeing more combinations of deep and machine learning combined, but in traditional sense, you would typically select machine learning or deep learning um, in, to solve most uh, most problems. Although again, we're now seeing the co combination of the two in, in some of the most complex models. So uh, another discussion question for you here, what level of AI have we achieved? Is it artificial super intelligence, general intelligence, narrow intelligence, or hu artificial human intelligence? So again, um, no one's getting graded on this. It's just uh, uh, just for some interaction here. So again, the level of AI that we've already achieved, and if you just type in the chat window, one, two, three, or four, uh, we'll be able to see this. Great, and the answers are rolling in. And folks are getting this right. Yeah, and the answer is, um, for those that are participating, the answer is uh, three we've achieved artificial narrow intelligence, right? Essentially the ability for machine learning or deep learning to do typically one task, to do it really well, but without the reasoning or the cognitive capabilities, the emotional understanding that we as humans have today. Great job, everyone. So that's the high level, right? AI, the ability for machines to complete human-like tasks, uh, machine learning, the most often used type of uh, of uh, artificial intelligence, and deep learning being that uh, more for the most complex uses like language, navigation, et cetera. So let's talk about the approaches to machine learning. So once we decided we're going to use machine learning, we got to decide the type or approach we're going to use. Then there's three primary approaches, supervised learning, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. So we're not gonna go into these great depth. We just wanna introduce these concepts to you today. But what you'll see with supervised learning is typically we know a lot about our, our data. We know um, we'll have multiple instances of data, which we call examples. Each of those examples will have what we call features, which are measurable properties. And then we'll have a label, which is do we um, essentially the outcome. So in this case, on the left-hand side, we can see that we have instances of uh, a, a handful or four uh, different patients here. Each of them have measurable properties or features of weight and height. And then we have the label of whether they have a, a good heart health or poor heart health. And what we do is we actually will run that data through our algorithm. So our algorithm starts to learn that information. And so then what will happen is We'll then put new data in, which is a, a certain weight, this case, and height. And typically, we're not talking about a single record. We're talking about thousands or tens of thousands of records. 
And then that now the algorithm is has the ability to predict whether that person is likely to have good or poor heart health based on, again, all the data that we've trained it on. So we're seeing this happen in healthcare, uh, not only with, um, you know, around predicting heart disease, but predicting, um, you know, potential cognitive diseases. Um, we're seeing it in, um, in radiology, uh, reading um, various uh, scans, x-rays, et cetera, and able to help uh, physicians and medical profession professionals actually predict whether someone potentially has or is prone to a certain disease. And again, a lot of times this is through supervised learning because we have a lot of data that we know about people with, again, these measurable properties and what ailments they may have today. Unsupervised learning uh, removes that label, that understanding of what the outcome is. So we still have, again, examples. In this case, we have eight examples, one through eight. We have uh, physical uh, properties that we can measure, right? The features, which is the gender and the age group. And then what we do is we feed that into the algorithm. But again, what we're saying by it's unsupervised is we're not telling it the, what the outcome is. We're not telling it whether it's good or poor heart health when we're training it. We're just saying, hey, here's the data. And then the, the model itself starts to cluster. So it starts to categorize this information and say, hey, you know what? Folks one, two, three, five, and seven are similar and four, eight, and six are similar based on the features. Now those features you can see are um, what we've really defined as those um, uh, relevant features is really gonna be the age group, right? So cluster A tends to be younger, cluster B in this case tends to be older. And the algorithm has actually determined that for us. And the last type or approach uh, to, uh, to machine learning, and, and again, there's, there's other approaches. These are the, some of the most popular is reinforcement learning. And many of us have probably in, in, encountered this. Um, so we see it in robotics. So that robot that we saw moving around, they use reinforcement learning. So the robot could learn how to actually, how, how to pick something up and how to pick it up without breaking it and how to be able to move it and to, you saw it toss it, et cetera. All of those actions, those have been reinforced through reinforcement learning. We also see it in gaming. Um, so again, going back to um, IBM in its original version of AI, Deep Blue, it was actually taught to play chess through reinforcement learning. So what it was is they taught the algorithm to, um, to pick, in this case, a piece, which was a pawn we're seeing here. That pawn was then, an action was performed. Um, so in this case, the pawn moved two, two spaces forward. The environment changed. And if there was, if it was actually a positive outcome, a neutral to positive outcome, then a reward was given. And they will repeat this process. So Deep Blue was actually trained on playing millions and millions of games of chess. So by the time it met Gary Kasparov, the Grandmaster Champion, it knew what the likely opening moves would be and how to counter those, how, how to play it's an effective mid game, and then how to, uh, again, work towards an end game. And again, that was all taught through, through reinforcement learning by playing, again, millions and millions of games of chess, something that you know, we as humans can't play millions and millions of, right? Um, we just don't have the time to do that. We, we can actually have AI can do that um, through the mechanism of reinforcement learning. So the, again, those are the approaches uh, to, uh, to machine learning. For deep learning, we have uh, uh, various uh, approaches all um, through artificial neural networks. And we have two common types of feed forward recurrent. We won't get to that uh, layer of information today, but we wanna, do wanna talk what an artificial neural network is. So again, we're using human or sentient being terminology here, right? The fact is, is that, uh, a machine doesn't have, again, intelligence. We prescribe you know, intelligence to it. It doesn't have um, a, essentially the ability to process information like exactly like we do in our brains, but it does emulate it. So you think about how do we process information in our brain? Well, we have these nodes, or, right? Essentially are neurons that are connected um, by synapses, right? And then essentially electrical wave goes over those synapses to those neurons or nodes and we have the ability to do all the things I'm doing right now, which you can't see because I'm not on video, but I'm animated, I'm moving my hands, I'm talking, and I'm reading all at the same time, right? 
Well, those are all essentially, again, electrical waves traveling over those synapses to allow me to do those things. Well, deep learning works very in a very similar way. What we do is we have these neurons that are stacked into these layers. And what we do is we input data into uh, the, the first layer that, that uh, data will get processed in over multiple layers, um, at least one, but many times multiple layers. And then we have an output. And essentially that's how an artificial neural network works. But again, what we're able to do is process larger volumes of data where um, also we have uh, less influence over that data. So what we're doing is we're essentially, in some cases, like those large language models, like we saw with chat GPT, or in this case, the you write um, um, uh, platform is what they, it does. It goes out and scrapes a bunch of content from the internet. And so it has all this content and it runs it through all these parameters. Well, that's what they're doing here with neural networks. So it's running it through the parameters. So when I say, hey, how is coffee grown and, and roasted? It can actually go through all that data and essentially put it, provide an output, which is, hey, it, you know, essentially coffee's grown here, it's roasted this way, et cetera. And some uh, um, ways that we use deep learning is I talked about natural language processing or NLP. Um, a great example um, is, uh, I'm gonna do it real quick here. Um, I usually don't do this live on a webinar, but I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to Siri and ask Siri what the weather is. Hello, Siri, what is the weather today? Hello, Siri, what is the weather today? It looks like it will be cloudy today. Right. So what so Siri has essentially done natural language processing. It understood language, right? That I was speaking to it. It, it, it understood the actual what I was asking it. And it was actually able to generate language. So these are all forms of natural language processing. Computer vision, we saw that earlier with um, the, the robot, right? The computer was actually able to see where it was in its physical environment. Right. We're doing this also with uh, autonomous or near autonomous driving. We don't have autonomous vehicles yet, but near autonomous vehicles with computer vision. Robotics, we saw that example. And again, if you want to look up some other examples, Boston Dynamics actually has a really cute video of their robots doing a dance. But, it, um, but it's not only in, in a, you know, those robots that we look at that potentially, you know, emulate humans, but robotic arms um, in manufacturing environments, et cetera. This is all done um, leveraging uh, approaches like deep learning. One question we do have to ask ourselves is who's responsible when machines are prescribing our future, right? Uh, this is something that we have to ask ourselves because for the first time, machines are starting to make decisions. So what are some decisions dec machines are making today? Well, you probably read marketing copy today, a blog, maybe an article, that was actually generated by AI. In fact, C CNET was starting to try to use uh, generative AI to write articles. Uh, I just read this morning BuzzFeed, I don't read BuzzFeed, but BuzzFeed is now stated that they're gonna use generative AI to actually start to write uh, content. Um, you also have probably uh, engaged, um, if you've applied for a job recently, a large company, they're using AI to help filter out potential candidates. Um, if you applied for a loan, um, if you uh, you probably um, at any lending institution, more and more are starting to use artificial intelligence to determine who is the most likely to pay back a loan and who is likely to default. So there's many ways that this these are, are um, technologies are being used today. But what we're doing is we're training it many times on old data, and that old data could be. Uh, be unethical entirely or contain biases against an individual or certain groups of people. So we need to make sure as we develop these autonomous solutions that when we're, we're creating uh, AI, that we're doing it in a responsible way. So essentially there, it's doing some good and I, good is relative. So that's why we say responsible technology. So it's not causing harm and it generally is having a positive impact because AI can be used in, in so many beneficial ways but we need to make sure it's a benefit. And again, not taking that data and doing things again to, to harm you know, groups or individuals, et cetera. So um, 
we have another discussion item here. Uh, so what machine learning approach is used in robotics? Uh, we talked about it briefly. Um, so is it supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning, or artificial neural networks? Again, one, two, three, or four here. And this is probably the hardest question we'll have today. And, and uh, again, no one's getting graded. This is all for fun. And again, uh, the answers are coming in. The most correct answer is uh, number three, which is reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is often used in robotics, but if you answered any of these, you actually were, were correct because we talked about artificial neural networks, right? With natural language processing, computer vision, that's being, that's being used in robotics. We, all, we use unsupervised learning because we're not always telling what the outcome is. Uh, less so supervised learning, but any of those would be correct answers. Great job, everyone. Um, so now we're into our last section here, where is AI is transforming our industry. So I alluded to the fact that we're uh, probably engaged with AI often. Um, so finance, the finance industry, what we'll see is before I get into the finance industry, a lot of data intensive industries are the first ones to be using AI, although again, is, as I shared earlier, many of us are being engaged are engaging with AI throughout the day um, in our personal work lives. But how is AI doing it? Well, I talked a little bit about lending institutions, right? They're actually taking data and to trying to determine essentially how to make, mitigate risk in their lending practices. They're also doing it uh, to protect us in fraud protection, right? So my credit card, um, I have fewer and fewer uh, attempts and fewer successful uh, purchases that are fraudulent purchases. And they're able to do this through artificial intelligence because they understand general spending habits, but also my spending habits and what I'm likely to spend my money on and where. Um, they're doing it in advisory services. So you'll see more and more advisement coming from artificial intelligence. Now we still have a human communicating that information to us, but a lot of that is being assisted by artificial intelligence. And that risk assessment I talked about with lending uh, practices and in other ways that uh, institu institutions will uh, manage money and uh, advisory services as well. Uh, we're seeing it in healthcare. Um, so we use that simple example of heart health. Um, I also started to speak to um, you know, the use in radiology, right? Essentially looking at um, uh, essentially scans, right? So you think about it, if I'm a healthcare professional, and let's just say I can, I look at it, and I'm making numbers up because I don't know, but if I'm a radiologist and I can look at uh, 100 scans a day and I work 200 days uh, a, a week, a year, excuse me, I'm looking at roughly 20,000 scans a year. I work for, you know, 30 years, you know, that's 600,000 scans I, I will look at over my, the length of my career. Well, an AI could look at 600,000 scans in maybe a matter of day potentially hours, right? So you think about that, they can ingest all that information that a, a radiologist of 30 years would have and have essentially that same level of information and maybe even being able to better see because they won't have some of the limitations we have with sight or our you know, own cognitive um, uh, preferences or uh, you know, inability to, to be able to process you know, some information, et cetera. And so what we're seeing now is AI actually helping us to identify. We still have a health professional and all of us, I think for at least the foreseeable future, will want a health professional involved in that process. But again, we're starting to use this for diagnostic purposes so we can better diagnose uh, current disease or potential diseases as well. We're using it in prevention um, and we're also using it to better understand the progression of disease. Um, so the Michael J. Fox Foundation uh, partnered with IBM and if you know anything about Parkinson's disease, it progresses in a nonlinear manner. And it's actually helping to identify how disease, the disease may progress and eventually in an individual, whether it's gonna progress uh, more quickly, uh, more rapidly or not. Um, and again, you're now also looking at pro uh, potential preventative measures to help it um, not pro uh, progress as quickly. Um, we're using it in treatment. In fact, um, if even if you look at, you know, uh, with, you know, COVID, but, you know, other, um, you know, viruses and et cetera, 
uh, we're using AI to define um, what they are. Um, you, uh, if, if you just look up um, protein folding um, and um, artificial intelligence, um, AI has uh, defined numerous proteins that were just before not um, not um, available or, or, or identifiable to humans. So we're using it in so many ways in healthcare. We're also using it in retail. Um, Again, many of us are online ex uh, shopping experience. We're using it, right? Um, in fact, dynamic, dynamic pricing is one thing that um, is actually many times uh, managed by artificial intelligence. So if you're on Amazon or whatever, those prices change all the time. Well, they change based on where you're purchasing from, um, what you're purchasing, the time of day or the day or the day of the week, um, the time of day, maybe the time, um, you know, what time of the year. Um, based on the supply and demand, a whole bunch of factors. In fact, I just read a story earlier this week where there was a, uh, a, a ski resort out west and they used dynamic pricing. And because there was such demand and limited supply for ski uh, lift tickets that day, they were, a single ski uh, uh, lift ticket was over $300 for that day, right? So that's, a, that's just a, you know astro astronomical now, amount seemingly, but people were willing to pay it because Again, they knew based on the demand for that day, based on the conditions, based on the day of the week, based on current demand, that they could charge over $300 for a ski lift ticket. So again, we're seeing that. We're also seeing it in recommendations, right? I purchased this one thing. They'd say, hey, you know what? This is something else you may be interested in. And I may actually provide you a, a discount or special offer on that. Um, and you know we're seeing it um, again. That extends to even our streaming services, et cetera. And now the integration of all that, right? If I do a search uh, on Google, Google owns YouTube. Now I'm seeing something on YouTube, uh, but it's also ex even extending to um, some of our streaming services and, and actual cable television as well. Um, so AI is is we're learning today is, is is a top priority, right? We're seeing AI and machine learning is a top um, investment priority for over uh, over one out of every two companies. Um, it's well ahead of other um, investments in uh, data analytics, big data, et cetera. So much as we've heard about data analytics, big data, et cetera, AI is the next frontier of investment from a technology perspective. But the, the challenge we have is many individuals just don't have the knowledge and skills to successfully deploy the technology. So all of you have invested an hour today to learn more about, again, at least the general concepts and terminology of AI, right? So you can go back and speak to, you know, intelligently to what AI is and isn't, right, at the end of this session today. But we still have to, whether you're a business professional and you're essentially a decision maker or a stakeholder, a product or project manager, you have to understand these technologies. This is not just in the domain of IT, right? It's not thrown over the wall and IT will take care of it because AI is to be deployed across the organization and the data that you're gonna use, the decisions that you're gonna make and how, and how that all works in your environment is gonna be decided by business professionals. Now you're gonna to need to work with technical professionals and you'll need data scientists and machine learning engineers, et cetera, and we don't, we have far too few of those as well. But again, this is gonna be a technology that is not gonna be in, in just in the domain of IT. It's gonna require everyone across the organization, much like we see with cybersecurity, et cetera, to be successful. So the last question I have, and then we'll go into the Q&A is, what do you hope to do with AI in the future? Uh, do you hope to plan to be a user of AI technology at work? Uh, do you plan to lead projects? Do you plan to become a machine learning engineer or data scientist? Um, or you don't plan to use it at work, you just want to continue to use it at home. Great. And we're seeing a couple different responses. Yeah, we're seeing folks that are um, expected use it, continue using it personally, but aren't sure if they're gonna be using it professionally or not yet. Great, thanks everyone for participating. Uh, for, uh, so obviously partnered with New Horizons, uh, New Horizons obviously provides a, a number of training opportunities around these technologies. This is a sample path for someone that wants to 
move into a professional career. Again, um, what we some of the slides we took today was from our AI for business um, or AI biz um, for those who need to operate at a business level uh, with the technology. Um, and then this shows you a path for the, again, those who want to move into uh, being a machine learning engineer um, and then on specific platforms as well. So in summary, before we move to the Q&A, um, right, AI is a technology concept. It's often implemented using machine learning and deep learning. Remember those uh, circles, the embedded circles. Um, again, machine learning and deep learning use utilize different approaches. We talked about uh, reinforcement learning and supervised and unsupervised learning with machine learning and deep learning. We talked about artificial neural networks. Um, AI is being used pervasively throughout industry and, in fact, in our personal lives as well. And again, you, we're going to need to look at how do we continue to evolve our own skill sets um, as the AI and data economy is challenging the skills we need to, to thrive in that environment, as well as enjoy um, using these technologies in our personal lives as well. So with that said, we're going to come to the Q&A. Um, so any question regarding the, the contents of this or anything related? Um, I would say the first question is the best question because it, it uh, opens it up for other folks to ask questions as well. So I, I, I challenge someone to, to ask the first question. And while we're waiting for the, that first question to get typed in, uh, one of the questions I, I often get asked is, um, you know, how can I tell when I'm using AI? Um, and the fact is, is that you really have to think about some of the things we learned today, like that autocomplete, right? That's nat natural language processing. Or if I have a home assistant, assistant at home, right? That was part of the um, you know title today. Well, home assistant uses artificial intelligence. Um, it is it's learning more and more about you, and that's how it gets smarter and is able to do more things that it seems like, hey, it's my personal assistant because it's learning about you. That's artificial intelligence is allowing it to do that. The same thing with your recommendation engines, whether again it's Spotify. Uh, recommending you know certain playlists or artists to you or Netflix recommending the next television series or movie to you. All of that is again using AI and those recommendation engines are doing that for you today. So it's really um, it's so commonplace in our lives we don't always think about when we're, we're engaged or interacting with AI. Um, but again, if you step back and think about it is hey, is this different than it was before? Is it likely because it's learning about me than it's likely to be AI? So I'm not seeing any questions coming in yet. We'll let it go for just another couple minutes here. We Well, if there's not any questions, I wanna thank everyone for taking the time today. Um, hopefully, you know the goal of this session was for you to learn a little about, about artificial intelligence. Um, to be able to understand um, how it's potentially being used in your uh, work or personal lives. Uh, and then, you know, it, whether to just better understand it going forward or if you integrate it into your work lives, um, to have the ability to do so. So uh, thank you for taking the time today. I appreciate you uh, participating in our uh, uh, in interactive exercises uh, throughout. Um, again, if you have any questions, um, obviously, um, We'd ask you know for you to reach out to New Horizons, your contact there. Uh, New Horizons is uh, our premier um, uh, authorized partner of Certain Nexus and very capable of answering a lot of the questions around um, how to learn more about AI and um, also supporting technologies as well. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you, everybody.